I'm Lynn Fraser. I'm here with Kay Vout, who's a psychologist at the Killaby Centre, and we're here with Robert Weiss. Robert, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm glad to do that. Um, I'm a recovering sex and love addict for about 31 years. I entered the rooms of S meetings in 1985. Um, and I saw as a part of my recovery that the next step for me was going to be trying to help people. And so uh, that combined with HIV AIDS and my seeing the relationship between sex addiction and people getting ill and back in the late 80s, early 90s really led me to join the field. And, and so I got my social work degree and I opened a clinic after working for Pat Carnes for a number of years. I learned in residential treatment really all, everything I needed to know from the outside in about sex addiction. I already knew the inside out part. And then uh, opened a clinic in 1995 in LA for sex addiction. And uh, I didn't realize at the time it really was the first outpatient intensive uh, structured program in the country for this work. And uh, I ran it for almost 20 years. Um, during that time, I've written eight books on the topic of tech and sex and intimacy and relationship and sex addiction. And um, I love writing and my life has come to life because I'm in recovery. And so I get to share that every day in the media. I get to share it in my writing and my blogs and in the different treatment centers that I now oversee or run because, you know, if you do something long enough, people actually think you know something and now I get to run things instead of just sort of starting them myself. So um, it's been quite a ride. Um, I will say this to the recovering people who are listening that um, my favorite piece of literature in the 12 step, um, all the content that 12 step literature offers is the promises because I can tell you as someone with sexual issues who had a lot of abuse in childhood that the last thing I thought I would ever be talking about in public was my sexual behavior or other people's sexual behavior or sexual recovery. Um, my life was so compartmentalized into who I wanted you to see over here and what I did sexually over there that um, when the promises came along and they, were telling, they told me I was not gonna be ashamed of what I had done, that I was not gonna wanna hide what I had done, that actually was gonna be something that I could use to help other people and I would no longer wanna hide, I was like, right. And, but I stand in front of thousands of people and talk about sex addiction and what my history is and how I understand the issue to be. I write books about it. I, I, I think the promises do come true. And, um, and so, you know, I'm very, very grateful to be here. That's great. So uh, do you have a quote or saying that you, that guides your work or that means something to you? Well, there's a bunch of them. I mean, um, what I would say to any woman who's experiencing an affair or uh, a male spouse who's cheating on her is, I'll tell you, this is not a quote, but it's a fact, it is never your fault, never ever. Um, I don't care if you haven't enough sex with him, if you're overweight, if you don't like him anymore, it doesn't matter. If he wants to go do something and he's unhappy with your relationship, there are many, many choices you can make other than cheating. Uh, that's what I'd say to all the ladies who get cheated on um, because inevitably you guys are gonna blame yourselves no matter what, I'm not thin enough or whatever. Um, I have some basic beliefs in recovery. I think, um, you know, what goes around comes around and uh, you're accountable for your behavior and therefore behavior has consequences. So you can do the efforts, which is the kind of the fuck it's like, I'm going to go do what I want to do and I'll drink and I'll use and I'll whatever, but know that you will have to pay the consequences at some point. And that's something that I think everyone in recovery lives with. So consequence, behavior has consequences is one of my favorite sayings. Um, another one is really that a life well lived in recovery should really be just one notch above boring. Because I think that that's what a life well lived is. It's a little bit of good and a little bit bad and some really fun times and a couple of really bad times, but mostly it's just kind of even and, you know, and that's not how addicts live. You know, we like intensity, we like drama. And when you find yourself in intensity and drama, you're not living in recovery. That's a simple thing. Because life lived in recovery should really just be one notch above boring. Doesn't mean like difficult things don't happen, but I try to keep myself on a path with as little drama as possible. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So when you first started in this in this field, you talked about the 80s and 90s and then going to school. What was available at that time for treating sex addiction, porn addiction, anything? Well, uh, there were individual therapists who Pat Carnes had trained or worked with who, understand how, who understood how to do the work. Um, or those of us in recovery who had studied with Pat or studied his work and because of our own recovery, we knew, how, we knew something about the work. Um, but that was it. Um, there was a small cadre of maybe 15 to 30 therapists in the United States that I knew because they would come to the same conferences and I would see them all the time. And it wasn't really until we turned the tide of internet porn, internet sex in the late 90s, I'm sorry, in the early 90s, 
that we started to see an escalation of se problem sexual behavior. So, you know, I think I would have had a, a small, interesting practice with guys who had sexual problems had the internet not come along. But because it came along, I all of a sudden had people flooding in with porn problems, with hookup problems, with th the fact that this highly pleasurable content and experience was so immediately available without any real forethought as it was in the past has left more people vulnerable. Um, and let me, I'll just give an example and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. I mean, back in the day when I was younger, if I wanted to go have sex, you know, uh, uh, and I was a healthy person, I had to go to a bar. <laughs> and I would go to a bar and I'd put on a, you know, a cheap shirt and some bad cologne. I'd look around to see if anybody looked back at me and gave me some vibe and maybe we'd start talking and maybe we had something in common and maybe we didn't. And maybe my best friend who knew I was dating someone else saw me in the bar and said, what do you, you know, now what I do if I want to have sex, I just pick up my phone and I click on my favorite app um, or have a date, you know? And so for those who struggle with impulse disorders, who seek, to dissociate or space out or get into pleasurable intensity of any form rather than dealing or having, or those of us who don't have the ability to deal with what's in front of us. And so we turn to pleasure and distraction as a source of making ourselves feel better or not feeling anything at all. Um, when the internet came along, it just escalated the problem because so many more people had immediate access. You know, if I wanted to look at porn in the 80s, I had to go to some icky place under a bridge. It had sticky floors and spend money that I didn't have to buy stuff that half the time I had to return because it was a video and they were expensive. And what about now? I just pick up my phone and I say, Siri, you know, show me some porn. And in 0.34 seconds, I have access to not just a magazine or a video as in 25 years ago. Now I have access to complete unlimited library forever of images that never end. And so, of course like gambling, you know, where you sit at blackjack and you have the card thing that never ends. It's not like they ever run out of cards when you're, you know, playing blackjack. Well, guess what? They never run out of porn now. And you can go 24 seven, just like a casino. So um, what has happened is for those people who are vulnerable to using intensity and pleasure as an escape, they found themselves increasingly hooked on internet porn, internet sexual hookups, internet, prostitution, and all the things that simply weren't available just a few years before. And of course, that has escalated as we've gotten more mobile. And now you're not just sitting in front of a computer. Now you have your phone, your laptop. You can be anywhere in the world. You can be connected anywhere, anytime. Um, of course, it's harder to help people work with it because life online is so ubiquitous. Everybody sort of has to be online on some level. And yet, that's like walking to the drug dealer's house for lunch every day. You know, It's just not an easy thing to handle. So these are the kinds of things that I'm facing now. And yes, with a much larger audience because the problem is much larger. So what is your approach? How do you, how do you help these people? Uh, I, I actually tell them how terrible they are, how shameful they are, how horrible people they are, and they really just don't deserve to live. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to put a little levity in because if I don't, Sex is hard to talk about. And one of the things I think that makes it makes me a good speaker about sexual issues is that I'm not afraid to talk about the hard stuff, but I always make people laugh a little bit. You know, um, If you're asking what treatment is about, I think, first of all, people who come to treatment for sex and relationship addiction are done. Like they are toast. They've lost their marriage or their second marriage, or they've been trying to date somebody for more than a month forever and they can't do it because they keep seeking out anonymous sex or they can't tolerate long-term intimacy because they have early trauma, which is really what underlies most of the issues I treat is early complex trauma. Um, so um, what treatment is, is taking that person who comes in to see me or to one of our programs who is saying to me, hey, Rob, you know, uh, and really what they're saying is, I'm not sure I want to stop the sexual behavior, but I, don't, I do want to get my wife off my back, or I do want to stop losing jobs, or you know what every addict wants when they go to treatment. They want their consequences to go away. And my job while they're in treatment is to begin to explore how sexual they've been and where they've been sexual and how they've been sexual and what their entire sexual life has been, not in a shaming way at all, but to simply put it on paper. Hey, let's look at what you did and what you've done. Now let's look at your life. You're married, you have kids, you're a gay guy, you have a relationship, you know, and how you want to live your life and how you've chosen to live your life based on your values and your beliefs and who you are. How do those things match up? And how has your sexual history led you astray from wanting to be in that relationship or wanting to pursue that degree, but you're too busy looking at porn to study? You know, how has the 
casual sex interfered with your having more long-term committed gay or lesbian relationship, you know, whatever the issue is that they want their goal in life, kids, family, education, or something in work, we're going to take a look at how their sexual behavior has interfered with or, uh, or violated really their goals and beliefs for their life. And, um, the thing about being an addict, as you well know, is you know, you're really not in the moment thinking about all of your behavior, all of your history. You're only thinking about what you just got into or just got out of. So treatment is a lot about looking at, well, I know that porn is a problem for you, but let's look at all your sexual life. Or I know that having affairs is a problem for you, but let's look at porn. Let's look at hookups. Let's look at, and we often find there's a lot of behavior there and that there's a lot more than has been going on than what simply brought them into treatment. And once we lay that out, then they often move into shame. Oh my God, how could I do this? This isn't who I wanted to be. You know, I've destroyed my life. I'm, I'm sleazy, I'm pervert, you know, all that stuff. And that's my job to rush in as a therapist and say, no, it's not who you are. It's what happened to you. You know, I don't think you intended to ruin your marriage, hurt your children, lose your lover of 20 years and not be able to get a job. I don't think that was your goal in life. But I do think that you learned some lessons around emotional survival and trauma based on your history that led you depending more, let's say, on behavior and on excitement and leaning into that for support than leaning into people. Um, I love the concept of chemical dependency because I think that what addicts are seeking is something that is dependable and reliable that will make them feel they want to, the way they want to feel and not make them feel the way they don't want to feel. And in, when seen in that light, it doesn't really matter whether you're seeking sex or gambling or drugs, or it's all about using something to depend on to make yourself feel better, to escape and get through the day. The problem is, is that what healthy people depend on is other people. Healthy people depend on friends. They depend on community. They depend on partnerships where there's trust and honesty and, and everything about them is known, you know, and this is not how most addicts grow up. So a big lesson that I have to teach them when they move into shame is, you know, these are survival skills. You know, I, I know that you feel badly that you hurt your wife. I know you feel badly that you ruined that relationship. And I'm sorry that be, that behavior has consequences and you're going to have to suffer the consequences of that behavior. But that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. That doesn't mean you're a sleaze bag. That doesn't mean that you are a pervert. It means that sex and sexual attachment and sexual pursuit and sexual intensity and sexual fantasy are ways that you learn to survive and we're going to teach you in treatment how to stop depending on intensity and fantasy as a way of feeling better and start depending on people like the ones you're in treatment with and me and my belief is that good treatment especially good residential treatment when it's done right and the older i get the more i understand this um, many of my clients are taught what it's like to be in a healthy family for the first time I'm 56 years old and I got to tell you that I'm still learning why I, my husband and I would rather be alone than have friends over, why we don't look forward to holidays. You know, uh, it's because of how we grew up, you know, now as at 56, I'm still learning, still learning that having a few people over on a holiday to have a meal and play cards is actually fun. And that inviting people into your life and building community and building close relationships where you are known is not only survivable, but, but is additive to my life. Because growing up, what I learned was stay away from people, don't trust them, handle it on your own, let people see the part of you that they might like or want to see and avoid the parts that they wouldn't like because above all, you want everyone to love and value and appreciate you and not, not know about the bad parts. And that's how many of us grew up, you know, surviving in environments where we had to look good or do what we thought would please our caretakers, but not necessarily knowing a lot about what met our own needs or which is often about, by the way, connection, relationship. I'm a huge fan of Brene Brown. I'm a huge fan of looking at, at the need for relationship and connection as a primary survival skill as much as we need to eat or, or be sheltered. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say before you ask a question is, because I feel strongly about this, is you know, when we come into the world mm -hmm. and in our first couple of years, if we don't get fed, we don't survive. If we don't get a place to put our head, we don't survive. And guess what? If we don't have love, nurturing, stimulation, and appropriate holding and mirroring and comfort and all that, if we don't get that from our caretakers, there is also a profound loss to the person, you know, and maybe they don't survive either. Many a child has, has 
died due to infantile depression or failure to thrive because they simply, they were fed and changed, but no one loved them. And now I don't want to be loved now the way I was loved when I was four or might've been loved when I was three. You know, I don't want you to pick me up in the air and say, coochie, coochie, coo, and cuddle me and throw me around and pat me on the head. You know, that was, that was what love was if I had had it then when I was two. Now as an adult, I still need to eat. I still need shelter. And I still need more sophisticated forms, adult forms of love, like appreciation or connection or to feel valued or to feel understood or to feel a part of, you know, and that's how I feel loved. So to me, this is the basic problem with addiction is that addicts grow up learning that ultimately people can't be depended on. You have to handle problems and issues on your own. And how do you do that when you're three? You dissociate, you use fantasy, you read a million books, you go somewhere else to find pleasure and comfort because your immediate world doesn't offer you that. And that's a survival skill. Unfortunately, adult life, when you had it want to have intimate, meaningful relationships, that doesn't really jive with being by yourself, you know, trying to feel better alone. It just, it only leads to addiction. And so to answer your question, mm -hmm. the biggest part of when you is get people socialized. But um, I was wondering if you could talk a little about the effect on the spouse or partner who's left alone with this, with addiction. Sure. Um, so m most often, but not always, the spouse of, of a sex addict is female. Um, and I run a program at the ranch in Tennessee and have run other programs where we have women's programs. And I can tell you that women come into sex addiction treatment, not indirectly. Uh, they come in through eating disorder treatment. When someone asks the right questions about their adult sexual history, they come in through drug and alcohol treatment. When you notice that they don't want to talk to that nice female sponsor you introduced them to, but they can't wait to get the cute to the cute guy behind her. So women come in through failed addiction treatment, through failed eating disorder treatment, through challenges with trauma. When they, when a therapist takes the time to look at their adult behavior. And by the way, and I am getting your question, Kay, but um, all too often my experience is that when people come and even come into treatment, even for sexual trauma in early life, we don't ask them about masturbation in adult life. We don't ask them about affairs. We don't ask them. We're so invested in talking about the trauma with some concept or belief that working on the trauma will heal their adult life that we often don't ask them the very questions around sex, intimacy, and relationship that an addict and a trauma survivor may be acting out but won't tell anybody that they need help with. And so the women are least likely to come forward with this because we already know what the culture says about a woman who's having a lot of sex, right? She's a slut, she's a whore, she's whatever. And of course, women have already internalized this. So they don't go to someone and say, I have a sex problem. The ones who come to therapy will say, you know, I have a problem with relationships, or I can't seem to meet the right guy or a woman, or, you know, I always seem to end up in these bad situations and dating. And then when you do a history, you find out, oh, well, that's because you have sex with everyone that you see, or, you know, that's because you date five different people at the same time, or, you know. So I want to say something about the women, and because we do have male spouses, and they go through a lot of pain and heartache, but it is primarily female spouses that we see in treatment. So I'm, um, so the spouses are most often wives, um, girlfriends um, of heterosexual men who have been living in some kind of marital or committed relationship where they often have kids and they've been together for six years, eight years, 10 years, whatever. And this guy has been because of early trauma and abuse acting out all over the place sexually. And he has hidden it from her so well. Um, and even when he isn't hiding it well and she questions him, he lies, you know, well, I never did that. I was never doing that. So she ends up really, as I think most spouses of, of addicts end up being kind of crazy people. Because when you live with a crazy person, you're going to become a crazy person if you're deeply involved with them. We actually have a diagnosis for this, by the way. It's called folie à deux. It means that if you are highly psychotic and paranoid and you're deeply involved with someone who isn't, that over time, that deeply involved partner will also start to become paranoid and think they're seeing things. Because when you live in close dependency, with an intimate partner, you start to take on some of their characteristics. And I think that is actually kind of a cool thing. Um, in fact, I'm working on a book, you'll like this, with a friend of mine named Stephanie Carnes, Patrick Carnes' daughter. And the book is called Pro-Dependency. That's P-R-O, Dependency. Because I have a great interest in talking about how I'm not really a big fan of things like of the concept of codependency, for example. 
Um, and I still, hey, I promise I'll get to the real spouses issue, but what we found in my field, and I'm really planning on extending my writing and talking about this into the general addiction field and caretakers in general, I don't understand why when, let's say, a wife of eight years, her, you know, she's been a frog in the boiling water, you know, her husband only drank a little bit when they, or she only knew about a little bit of drinking early on, and then by the time they're eight years in and have two kids, he's a solid drunk, and she's, you know, pounding bottles and, you know, trying to make excuses to his boss and working double time to cover everything he's not doing at home and worried sick about him for years. When he finally gets sober, we turn to her and we say, well, let's talk about your problem. <laughs> let's talk about your family history, why you married this person, why did you exhaust yourself? How about love? Like, who wouldn't, if you love your family and you love your family members and you're committed to their health and welfare, who wouldn't give yourself up in order to make sure that they thrived? Even if that means letting your life, your own life fall apart. That's, I think, healthy love. You know, if your partner had cancer, if they had, you know, a profound heart condition, you would work double time to make sure they were cared for and the home and everyone would say, good for you. But somehow when you do that, when it's an alcoholic or a drug addict or some other kind of addict, someone says, oh dear, you're codependent, you're enabling, you're Elena. And I just don't like that. So one of the things I'm working to do is, is say, you know, whether codependency exists or not, it's a later, later term issue. In the beginning, when someone comes in and they've been living with an addict, especially a sex addict, but any addict, they need, I'll tell you what they need and what they don't. They don't need to talk about their family history. They don't need to talk about their history with this addict in terms of their behavior or their history. Because the minute you start talking to a partner, partner of an addict about them, they who are already thinking, God, isn't there something I could have done to make this better? Now you've told them, oh yeah, if we look at your family history and your history with your husband or wife, we can absolutely see all the problems and mistakes that you've made and all your problems. And then, and, and by the way, that's called codependency and you need to go to Al-Anon and blah, blah, blah. And guess what? They never come back. We have lots of problems with spouses of addicts getting them into treatment. And as therapists, we often say, oh, those spouses, they're so difficult. They just want to point a finger at the person who did this to them and get them fixed. And I think that's an excuse on the part of therapists who have not done a really good job of being invitational and supportive to spouses who are hurting, who have poured their life on the line to try to help somebody or a family survive, and they're exhausted, and they're overwhelmed, and a part of them feels like they haven't done a good enough job or it would have been fixed. And what we need to do is love them, support them, thank them for their hard work, help them understand that they have been, they have been victimized in this situation. You know, I love Al-Anon, but to say, don't be a victim, it's like, well, that's nice for the future, but let's talk about the last eight years where this person has been lying to you, manipulating, telling you they're not where they are when they say they are, you know, hiding bottles or hiding sex partner or whatever it is. And so, you know, taking a more pro-dependent, positive dependency approach for spouses, validating their losses and their trauma of living with this person and trying to make it better and having not been able to fix it. I think if we give that a year, maybe they might want to talk at some point, if it occurs to them about how they landed with this person or why they put up with this. Or, but I think to come at partners at the beginning with a self-examination or a label is not good treatment. And so to come back to your question, Kay, um, what I do with partners of sex addicts and love addicts is I don't tell them to not look through his emails. I don't tell them to, lock through his, to not look through his cell phone bill. I don't tell them to stop doing detective work. I don't tell them to stop reading every book on recovery they can, because first of all, I know they're gonna do that anyway. It doesn't matter what I say. And second of all, um, you know, if their goal as a, part, as a couple is to regain trust, and that's what's lost in sex addiction relationships is trust, the only way trust is gonna be regained is by that person understanding they're in the doghouse, they're one down, because they've cheated on you, they've lied to you, they've been drinking all the time, they haven't been meeting their family responsibilities, and you have been suffering as a result of that, and you shouldn't trust them. When a spouse comes to me and says, you know, well, I wanna know where he is 24 seven, and I wanna track her on his phone because he used to be with prostitutes, he used to be having an affair, you know, all that. I don't say, well, dear, that's a little codependent of you. You know, he has to work on his recovery for himself. I say, where can we get the software? Because if the goal is for her to begin to trust him again, He's not going to say, oh my God, I can't believe she wants to track me. Like, how sick is that? He's going to say, as the therapist says, of course she wants to track you. She wants to be able to trust you again. And why should she trust your word since your word has not been true for so long? She needs your actions to be trustworthy. And that's going to take time. So in the meantime, you're going to have to be accountable to her. You're going to be one down. You're not going to get your way. You're going to have to come home on time. And I 
just wrote a book about this, which is a, by the way, I have to say to your folks, a fabulous book on women who've been cheated on and on men who've cheated on their women. And it's called Out of the Doghouse. And it is literally a book explaining to women and validating to your question, Kay, that they have every right to be furious. They have every right to not trust. And when that guy comes back to her and says after 90 days, are you going to get over it? I mean, come on, give me a break. You've been angry for months. And she says, well, let me wait. Hold on a second. You were cheating for six years and I'm supposed to not be angry after 90 days. That doesn't add up. As a therapist, my job is to support her and say, you be as angry as you need to be. Just don't hit him, you know, and don't make any threats that you aren't going to carry through on, like say you're going to leave when you're not. But other than that, you can be angry, you can kick him out, you can go sleep in the other, you know, whatever you need to do to feel safe and to begin to grow trust again. So in answer, the big answer to your question is that I have a much larger vision for what the partners of addicts need than um, to be told to look at themselves. I think they need a lot of validation for having supported and loved their family, for having had the hope, for having held out the hope that things will get better for the whole family. You know, that's what we do as therapists. We hold hope for people who are hopeless. Well, that spouse has held the hope for those kids and that addict alcoholic that things are going to get better. And so I'm not going to call them names. I'm going to validate them, support them. And I think addicts, spouses of addicts, most of all need, it's kind of like they've been hit by a truck. You know, once the person goes into treatment or once they find out what's been going on, especially with sex addicts, and they suddenly realize, oh my God, he was having an affair when we were on a honeymoon. He was sleeping with my best friend. He was, and the last thing they need is investigation or blame. You know, they're horrified. Their, their whole life has been turned upside down. Their hopes for the future, their thoughts about who their partner was and what they shared, that's all demolished when that guy says, well, yeah, I did have three affairs and I have seen a few, pro I mean, it's gone. And what's gone is trust. So for that man who has been drinking or using or sexual acting out or gambling with family money, the answer for you is to be non-defensive, to own that your behavior has consequences, which will, I promise, go on far longer than you want them to. And you got to eat crow for a while because you've really screwed this up. And yes, you screwed it up because you had early trauma. Yes, you screwed it up because it was survivorship. Yes, you screwed it up because it was the best you could do but you're still responsible for it. And if you wanna be with this man or this woman, you've gotta clean this up and it's gonna take a while, maybe a year or longer. So my goal is to validate spouses, to give them, especially women, empower them to feel like it's okay to be angry for as long as they need to be angry, empower them to feel like they don't have to forgive right away or anytime soon, and, and also to give the message to the guy that if you want this relationship back, you have a lot of work to do. And it's going to be things you don't necessarily want to do. You know, now you're going to have to be a fully participating member in this coupleship, in this family, and you're one down on the trust level. And you're going to have to earn your way back to trust by being on time, by calling when you're going to be late, by telling her what you're doing, by explaining things honestly and truthfully so that she can regain trust. Um, so my message is the part, to the partner is good for you. You survive this horrible situation and you still love him and your family or her and your family. Now let's honor you for what you've been through and support you toward regrowing a new relationship if that's what you choose to do. Question, uh, you mentioned how people that are hooked on porn are going for the, 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 the thrill, that there's a chemical reaction in the brain, there's a dopamine, there's the excitement, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and we've also been talking about internet and porn addiction being so available. I have young grandsons who are nine mm -hmm. and 10 years old, and I know that um, that's in the world now. How, how would you talk about, I guess there's two parts to this. One is, what effect does that have on someone's sexuality as it's starting to form and they're exploring their own sexuality? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is, and then how do you actually treat someone who's addicted to that kind of mental brain stimulation? Um, this is a great, this is a great question um, because I've been doing sex addiction treatment and of course I am myself a sex addict. I've been looking at this issue and dealing with adults with this issue for almost 30 years. But in the last eight, I would six or eight, I, really since social media has developed, start to really roll out in the, about 2007, eight, we have a new population. And I'm not sure that I can call them sex addicts because we don't have enough research. 
what I can say is that they have the, what I would call them as porn dependent. Meaning, so here, let me explain the difference. To me, a sex addict is someone who had early trauma around intimacy, relationship, attachment, sexuality, family life. They learned there wasn't anyone to depend on uh, except themselves. They used fantasy as a means of dissociation and survival. Um, maybe they were sexualized in some way through covert or overt incest or something that went on in their world that they never told their parent about because it wasn't safe. And so they're sexualized at an early age and they have a lot of early trauma and they don't have a lot of trust in people. And so they turn to highly intensive sexual behavior and romantic behavior to try to feel a sense of connection when everything they learn growing up tells them connection is scary and will hurt you. But what, uh, what we know is that without connection, you don't survive as a human, you don't do well. So that's the challenge for an addict is I need to depend on people and I need to depend on relationships and I need to depend on care and trust and love, but I don't trust the people who might give it to me. <laughs> and, um, and that's the client I've been seeing for 25 years. That's the person I am. I mean, I have a mentally ill parent and my mother was psychotic and bipolar from the time I was two and a half or three. She was in and out of hospitals. I had that kind of childhood. I learned about sex as a means of self-serving and fantasies as a means of survival at three, at four, at five. But now we're talking about a different population. We're talking about a population that maybe didn't have that childhood. Maybe they grew up in a reasonably healthy family. Maybe they grew up in a reasonably healthy environment, but maybe they're a little shy or they have a few social issues or whatever. And guess what is the hardest, most emotionally challenging time in terms of relationships and, social, and being social in your life, period, the end, is being 13 to 16. You know, high school is the hardest time. You've got to be picked for the team or not. You've got to get a girlfriend or not. Um, by the way, there's a fabulous and very painful but amazing series about teen suicide called 13 Reasons Why on HBO. And you watch this young woman uh, after who's already passed away. She's already committed suicide. She, she created a series of tapes explaining to each person who hurt her in high school, who led her to make that decision, there's a tape about each one of them and there's 13 tapes and that's why it's called the 13 reasons why. And to watch someone go through the world of being a teen today, or even when we were teens, it's just hard. And kids are mean, you know, they're clicking, they're, they're, they're weaning each other out, they're in power struggles. That's part of being a teen. Is that a pecking order, that figuring yourself out, all of that. Mm -hmm. What if you're not up for that? What if you don't know how to do that? What if you're not good at that? What if, you find some porn at 11 or 12 and wow, that's really fascinating. And wow, that's really exciting. And wow, it, it feels connecting because that's the thing about sex addiction or ver versions of using sex as a form of connection. It does feel like you're connecting. You're talking to someone or you're looking at images or you're feeling excited about those images or that person. And so it can feel like it can take the place of bottom line is I see young men in particular and some young women get young women getting involved with porn at 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16. Um, some too early, some, you know, it's not too early, but the problem for them is, is that they choose the porn over people. It's easier to do the porn than try out for the team. It's easier to do the porn than, you know, try, try to get to be a cheerleader. It's easier to look at the porn than to try to get a girl to date me or whatever. Um, and so rather than getting picked on or not being part of the clique or being told that you don't want to go to the prom with me, I'm just gonna look at the porn. And so I come home from school and I'm looking at porn and then I'm not getting my homework done. And then I get into school or college and then my default mode for social relationships is looking at the porn. And so what I think we have is a, a, a small percentage of our young people who have opted out of building intimate social relationships for whatever reason. Um, Maybe it's their issues, maybe it's the environment they're in, who knows. And you know, they start that at 13 and all of a sudden they're 23. They've never had a date, they've never had sex with a real person or only very casually. They have no idea how to build an intimacy relationship or date someone. And, but they sure know how to look at porn. And by the way, the men who have these issues have been looking at that porn for five years, starting at 17 and now they're 22. They don't even get erections when they have sex with a young man or woman their age because they are so hyper stimulated, what I would call dependent on the high level of stimulation that the porn provides that just being with a person, not only is anxiety producing, but it's not stimulating enough for them to get an erection or get aroused. And so these people have learned by the time they're 22 that the only thing that turns them on is porn. And they, and those people look like a sex addict, right? Because they're not dating, they're not really with people, they're, 
just using the porn or, or webcam kind of situations to be sexual, and yet their life is not progressing because they're not dating, they're not doing well in school, they're not doing well in their first job because their default for support and stimulation and comfort is porn. However, unlike your traditional sex addict, my experience is if you take the porn away from that 15 or 16 or eight, well, if you take the porn away from that 22 year old who's coming with a problem and you say, you're not gonna be looking at porn anymore and we're gonna to commit to that, but you are, and we're gonna to commit to this too, gonna to have to join that baseball team at work. You're gonna to have to go join that speed dating club, you know, and actually meet people to date. And I get them out, push them literally, like a good parent out into the social world, they start liking that because now they're old enough and secure enough in some ways that they're not, you know, they're not 15. They're not as vulnerable even. And they find that they like being on the team or they like dating or they like making friends. And what's interesting to me about that population is they don't put the porn aside and start seeing sex workers. They don't put the porn aside and start having affairs. That was a, what a traditional sex addict would be. If I told a traditional sex addict, someone who has early complex trauma to put down the porn, um, they would just pick up some other form of sexual stimulation. Um, they would start you know, doing something else. But these young men and women are not, it seems to me they're more dependent. That's their, the porn is their go-to place when they're uncomfortable, but they have matured developmentally. They have solid attachment. So they can bond and build relationship. And they're not as tied to returning to the sexual behavior because their needs start getting met in real life. This, what I would call porn dependent population, um, we don't have any research. I mean, we barely have any information about them or research. So, you know, I am very cautious about wanting to call them sex addicts because my experience of a sex addict is someone who, you know, when you tell them to put this down, they don't just start getting better. You know, they need a lot of intensive work about socialization, about trauma, about isolation, about triggers. They really are addicts. But these like 16, 15, 14, these people who picked up porn in their mid to late teens and all of a sudden that's all they've had since they were, 16 and now they're 22, I think that a lot of them are much more intact and able to carry on their lives with good instruction and boundaries. And if I found one of them wasn't, I might begin to say, well, maybe they do have early childhood experiences and maybe we need to look more closely at that. But what I don't want to do is over pathologize a 15 year old who's been looking at porn for a couple of years, missed the team, missed the dating, uh, and now has become dependent on the porn. But if you put them in the right circumstances and take the porn away, they'll start growing and maturing without necessarily, let's say, having to go to 12-step meetings or having to have three years of therapy. You know, they may not need all of that because their injuries are later and their deficits are later. Um, so that's kind of how I look at that population. And, I, and I, we just don't have enough definitive research for me to say, oh, well, this is who they are and this is what they need. But I think to call them sex addicts is premature and uh, kind of undermines the work that I do with sex addicts because these people are much more easily helped. So oh, the, I want, wait, wait, I'm sorry, Lynn. No, go I want to say thing about kids. Mm -hmm. So kids and porn. Um, I'm not Gail Dines. You know, I don't think that porn is ruining our generation, ruining our kids, you know, is completely against women and women's value. I just don't believe that. You know, I think there were people who said that alcohol was ruining our culture, ruining our people, ruining our young adults. And then we got this thing called prohibition in America. That didn't work so well. I don't think you can take people's pleasures away from them uh, gambling, gaming, sex, um, uh, alcohol, drugs, and then tell them that, you know, they just need to get by. People, even healthy people like distractions. <laughs> even healthy people like to have a drink or two occasionally or even get drunk. That doesn't mean that there's something wrong with alcohol or they're alcoholic. So the idea of like banning porn or seeing it as being the enemy, I just don't ascribe to that because I do believe that most people have porn in their life and it's not a problem. Just like most people have a drink or occasionally go to a casino or most people do pretty well with healthy pleasures. It's just the vulnerable, whether they're vulnerable at younger age or they're vulnerable at an, at a more adolescent age, the vulnerable who turn to pleasure as a form of escape, those people need help. Um, do I think our eight, nine year olds should be looking at porn? No, absolutely not. I don't worry necessarily about the 16 year old boy who's looking at porn. Because the news is, I hate to tell you this, and everybody, every 16-year-old boy is looking for We've tried to do research in Canada and in these states, uh, looking at kids who look at porn versus cohort groups, uh, you know, sample groups of kids, let's say 100, mixed male and female who don't look at porn. And guess what? We can't do that study because we could not find 
30 kids in America who weren't looking at porn, no less 100. So when I go to an audience, I talk to therapists, I'm like, so how many of you guys think your kids aren't looking at porn? I mean, you know, that all your clients' kids are looking at porn, but how many kids are your, and every therapist says, oh, no, 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 my, not my kid. And I say, well, think again, because every child is looking at porn, everyone. They may not feel good about it. Their parents are against it. They may have only looked at it once or twice, but they're looking. And by the way, we looked at porn too. You know, we didn't have unlimited access, but somebody had dad's Playboy. Somebody was at a sleepover and passed some magazine. You know, we had access to it too. It just wasn't in the same form. So, um, do we need to find ways to limit porn access to people who are under the age of 13, 14, 12? Yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Is that going to happen? I doubt it. Because I don't see that, you know, I mean, if I have a smartphone, it's just my thumbprint that makes it work. Well, you know, I can figure out how to get my dad's thumbprint on a phone. You know, I mean, kids are going to find it if they want to. What I think is missing and what is absolutely essential is education. And I don't put this on the schools because I think the schools educate our kids just like they should. They, they teach them what makes, you know, what the birds and the bees are. They teach them how to get transmitted, sexually transmitted diseases and about pregnancy and all that stuff. They're teaching them the facts of human sexuality. That's what school is for. But I, what I say to the adult population who's listening is that our kids are getting their sex education from the pornographers. And that's our fault. Because every parent, I, I don't think a parent any longer has a out about talking to their kids about sex. I think every one of us has a responsibility now, no matter what your faith, no matter what your belief, to sit down and there are lots and lots of books, how to talk to your kids about online content at eight, how to talk to them about online content at 10. You know, we have books for every age group now. There's no excuse for a parent not sitting down at least with an 11 year old for sure and saying, hey, you may see some of these things online. Let me tell you what they are. They're adult entertainment. That means that just like when you watch Star Wars, there really aren't lightsabers. Well, there really aren't people doing that much in the real world, but that's what porn is. It's like a movie. So, you know, and adults a lot of times use it for entertainment, but they don't expect themselves to be having that kind of sex, nor do they expect their partners to be like that. So let me, as mom or dad, tell you what sexuality is in a relationship. Let me tell you what sexuality, if they were really brave, what sexuality is for your mom and I in a healthy way. You know, we loved each other. We cared about each other. We saw this as fulfillment of our whatever. In other words, kids learn about sex at school and they see sexual behavior being carried out in pornography. But it's us, it's parents who have to teach them that sex and intimacy go together. And that this is how in an intimate relationship you develop sexuality. And this is what casual sex is. And if we're not willing to do that, then we are giving up our responsibility about what our kids are gonna to learn to the pornographers. Because for sure, they're gonna learn, I mean, they're watching porn, they're masturbating to porn, they're gonna think that's what sex is. And believe me, if you watched I Dream of Genie and Star Trek all day, you would think that there were genies in bottles and you know, people landing on other planets, because that's your reality. Someone needs to say, oh, that's you know, not real. And in the world that we live in today, which has a lot of trouble separating what is real and what is fake, it is really up to a trusted parent to say, I got to tell you, kid, that may look exciting, but that's not the real thing. And if we don't do that, then we are going to have a problem. And we already do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How's that for a speech? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fascinating. And so when you're dealing with um, someone who comes to porn through earlier childhood trauma, complex developmental trauma, then you would work on the trauma first and not no. How does that work? No. Um, there's a great uh, statement that I wish they had taught me in graduate school. I wish I could tattoo it on the forehead of every therapist backwards so they see it in the mirror in the morning. And this is the statement for every therapist is watching. Behavioral problems require, capital R, require behavioral forms of treatment and intervention. So if you are working with someone who is depressed because their parent died or they don't know which job to take or they have a history of you know dropping out and not committing or they don't know about date if it's a psychological social relation whatever you can do whatever form of therapy you want you know you can do Jungian you can do trauma-based you can do EMDR I don't care but if someone comes into you and they tell you they're cutting on themselves or they're drinking or they're using or they're sexing and it's interfering with the functionality of their life then it is, then I become a cognitive behavioral therapist. Then it is upon me as a therapist to step in with contracts 
and agreements, just like if someone said they were suicidal. If a client says to me they're suicidal, they taught me day one. Well, you know, you sit with them, you understand if they have a plan, what would that be? You make contracts with them, you sign things. It's exactly the same when they come in saying, I have a behavioral problem with the casino, with the porn shop then we have to make behavioral agreements and start holding you accountable to them so the behavior will stop. My expectation is the most extreme behaviors, sexual behaviors when I'm doing treatment will stop at the end of the first session. Um, and we're gonna make that agreement and you're gonna call me every night during the first week and tell me how you did. And you know, in other words, I'm gonna be, begin to build this idea in, in you that when you make these sexual decisions or drug and alcohol decisions, you're really not alone. You're accountable to me. Because you said to me you weren't going to do it. And then you went out and did it. And so when they do it, I'm going to confront them. In other words, the behavior with, add, with addictions and behavioral problems, the behavior has to be addressed first. Because the person is, n number one, they're not available for therapy. Because anytime anything difficult or uncomfortable comes up, they just go look at the porn or find a prostitute or go drink. So what are you really building or working on in therapy if they just return to that default mechanism to get better, to make themselves feel better. And in addition to that, that default mechanism, which seeing the prostitute, which is seeing the prostitute or playing blackjack or eating or spending, that has consequences. And so what's gonna happen is over time, your client is just coming in with more shame, more job losses, more financial problems, and then you gotta deal with all that and you never get to the problem. You have to understand that addicts and people who act out sexually or you know, in, the way, in an addictive way count as addicts that we don't have strong affect management skills. We don't have strong self-containment skills. If we did, we wouldn't turn to heroin to feel better. <laughs> we wouldn't turn to compulsive masturbation. We would turn to people. We would turn to comforting relationships because that's healthy. Addicts don't do that. So um, I can't raise someone's anxiety in therapy by talking about trauma when they don't know how to not see a prostitute if they drop a pencil. You know, my clients need in the beginning of treatment to gain what we call affect management skills or the ability to tolerate their feelings and examine their feelings, the ability to self-soothe and comfort themselves. And most of all, in my world, they need to have established social relationships that are non-sexual with people they can turn to for support. So I know as the client gains what I would call ego strength or a stronger sense of themselves, and they gain distance from the behavior, whether it's drinking, using, sexing, whatever it is, and they grow the, so their social support around not doing it, then they start coming in and being more stable. Then they come in and they say, I know a client's ready to do trauma work, for example. When they come in and they say, you know what? I felt like going through that red light district on Thursday, and instead I called my sponsor and I drove the other way. So what they're saying to me there is, I had the impulse, but instead I thought about it, I thought of you and our work, and instead I did what you said and I reached out to someone and I didn't do it. That tells me that they have begun to incorporate and internalize and begin to manage the behavior problem on their own. And that allows me to step out of this sort of containment role, this confrontation role, this managing the symptom role, and I can step back and say, oh good, you're managing the symptom with your social support and the emotional growth you're having. Now we can start to look at what has driven that symptom. I will say this, and I think it's important to say, there are people who can't stop their behavior. You know, they just can't. You know, you can see them three times a week and get them on medication. You can have them in 12 support meetings a week and they just can't because they don't have the sufficient internal ability to support themselves through that stage. Or maybe they um, have other addictions that are occurring like alcohol or drugs or other things that leave them vulnerable to other forms of acting out. When I have someone who has multiple addictions and I can't get them to stop and I've used all the tools at my disposal, which is more sessions, evaluating for medication, going to more support groups, getting more homework, checking in with me more often. I only have so many things that I can do to help someone outpatient. And when they get to a point where they're still drinking and using, they're still acting out sexually, they're still risking their life or putting their goals at risk, on a daily basis, and I've done everything I can to try to intervene, then I think, well, maybe they need to be in a safer place. That's why we have treatment centers, so that they can be in a place where they really can't act out that behavior. They can't leave, they get, can't get on the computer, they can't do it, and, and they're faced with all the feelings that come up around that with no place to escape, because all around them are people who just wanna love and support and nurture them, and they can't act out. 
And so what's going to come up is all of the stuff that is of the trauma. I do believe in residential treatment, by the way, that you can start trauma work because you have someone really contained and really supported and you're feeding them and you're helping them get through the day and you're helping with their laundry. And they, you know, they're kind of residential programs are a little bit like bringing someone back to childhood. You know, you are reparenting them. You are holding a space for them to be with their family of peers while we take care of the hard stuff, like making sure they have a bed and making sure they're fed and making sure the day goes well and supporting them and nurturing them and keeping them in that safe family. As I said at the beginning, I think treatment and recovery is some of the places where my clients for the first time at 40 or 50 may experience what it's like to be in a healthy family, um, where people listen to you, where they don't shame you, where they interrupt you when you're about to hurt someone else's feelings and help you find a different way to say it. So you don't alienate that person. Where you learn how comforting, supportive it is to be surrounded by people who care about you, who know everything about you and love you anyway, just like healthy parents. And my experience is when you build that kind of therapy environment, um, clients learn lessons that they will never forget. Um, I will say this to you and I will shut up. <laughs> when someone goes to treatment in a place that I run, I know they've done well because for the next six months, they don't call me once a week. They call each other. My clients will leave treatment and say, I want to stay in touch with the people I was in treatment with. And they do. They form like Skype meetings. I have clients who six or eight at a time will form a Skype meeting and they'll talk once a week or once a month for a year because that's where they came to find their primary bonds within their family of peers. You know, to me, a successful outcome of treatment is not that the therapist, they feel that they trust and love their therapist. To me, a successful outcome of addiction treatment is that they trust and love the community that they know they have to be a part of in order to survive. Um, that can be a, a faith-based community. It can be a therapeutic community. It can be a clinical community. It can be a 12-step community, but they need to know that they need other people to turn to on a regular basis who know and love them and understand them other than a therapist or a wife, um, but people who get them, get their stuff. You know, I mean, this is why, you know, I don't, I, I will stop, I promise. Um, this is why I am such a strong believer in 12-step recovery. You know, I don't care if you don't believe in God or the big G. I don't care if you don't like parts of it or you think parts of it don't apply. What happens in 12-step meetings is you go to a place over and over again, you raise your hand, you talk about really difficult things, people listen to you, and then afterwards they come up and they give you hugs and they give you their phone number and they ask you out for coffee, and basically you get the opposite experience you got growing up, which is it's good to talk about my problems, and when I do, people embrace me and they support me. That lesson needs to be in real time learned over and over and over again because when an addict is reduced by stress or difficult circumstances to a really uh, to being vulnerable as any emotionally challenged person is when they're under stress, they're gonna to revert to their behavior unless they have those people around and they keep those people around that they can comfortably reach out to for support rather than depending on the substance or the behavior, they will depend on people. So no, I don't do trauma work in the early stages, but I do wanna know enough about their trauma to be able to say, Right. So you're not a bad person. So you're not, um, you didn't mean to hurt your spouse. You didn't mean to ruin your life. But because of the things that happened to you, you ended up making choices that aren't healthy ones for you in your adult life. I want the trauma to do shame reduction in the beginning so I can help say this happened to you and that's why you're like this. But not to explore in a deep way because in the beginning they don't have the tools or the ability to tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least with sex addicts. So what's your sense of, um, you've worked with a lot of people, what's your sense of, <laughs> of what it is that some people recover and go into recovery and some people don't? Mm. Do you have a sense of around willingness or readiness or? Sure. Um, you know, I do think to an absolute, I, I believe it's absolutely true that addicts, are in denial about the damage they're causing or how important their life situations and people are. And so they will say, I'm fine and I don't have a problem, maybe at the loss of a marriage, maybe at the loss of their reputation, and they will keep drinking or using or sexing because they think they're fine. And so I know that addicts can often tolerate a lot of losses, a lot of pain before they, as you said, become, mot I'll use the word motivated, to want to create change in their life. I think they're willing, but they're not motivated. Like they'd like it to happen, but they don't necessarily want to put it down. 
Now, there are some people who are, I think there are people who don't, there are certainly people who are so wounded or maybe some were born this way that they can just roll over their circumstances and say, well, I'll just move on to the next marriage. I'll just move on to the next, you know, um, they don't form de attachments. They don't feel badly about having hurt or let down people. And I can't really help those people, you know, um, they don't need my help. They don't really care about what's happened. They're just going to move on. And I have to accept as a therapist that there are people who don't have the emotional skill set or the psychological ability to recover. They are built in a way that um, because they maybe don't have remorse or they are so um, wounded in some way that they can't see beyond themselves, or maybe they have biological challenges like they're on the spectrum or they have some kind of mental illness and they may not to be able to recover from addiction, nor may they be ever made to be willing enough. So the reason I say that is because I think sometimes we take someone and we push them and we push them about how much they've ruined their life and they've hurt these people. And, you know, we kind of really try to make them see, gosh, if you just stopped doing this, your life would be so much better. And, and some people can suffer as a result of that. They don't need reminders. They don't need it shoved in their face as much as maybe traditional addiction counseling has done. Um, uh, on the other hand, we also have to accept that there are people, no matter how much we uh, push in front of them, they're not going to want to change. And so, you know, I truly don't think as much as you and I would like to, Lynn, be able to say, oh, well, it's the person who has the red right ear that's going to recover and has the blue left ear that's not. You know, the reality is it still comes down to relationships and community. It comes down to how much is that person suffering as a re result of losing their connections, feeling disconnected, not being a part of having secrets, living a double life, and having all these consequences, does that cause them pain? And do they want that pain to stop? And can I instill in them enough hope that if they stop that, that the rewards of community, relationship, connection, and healing will be greater than the immediate reward of their using or acting out? Those people I can help. But I can't help everyone. Not everyone will hold on to that hope, and not everyone really cares whether they have consequences for their behavior or not. Um, and those people really, um, they're on their own. So, yeah, as far as diagnosing these people with a, with a clinical diagnosis, aren't they just having sex and having fun? And what's your idea about that? Why are we criticizing them and labeling them as sick? This is a really important question because people in the sexual health community who I admire so much because, you know, they said, we are not going to exclude homosexuality as being unhealthy. We're not going to exclude fetishism as being unhealthy. You know, the sexual health community fought very hard for people whose behavior in the bedroom was private and didn't hurt anybody to be non-pathological. And I think that they really get, and especially for me as a gay man, they get a big vote of my appreciation. But when sexual health becomes exclusive and you start to say, but those people can't be sex addicts or those people can't have a problem, then you're work at expanding the field starts to work against you because while some in the sexual health community might say, well, any kind of consensual sex that someone has and they choose to have is perfectly fine. And if it hurts their relationship or it hurts their, well, that's their choice, you know? And I, because I have an addiction background, I think, and a trauma background, I think to myself, well, that sounds right, but I know so many sexual trauma survivors who have become sex workers. And they're not particularly happy being prostitutes, or they may be very defensive about their being prostitutes, but they did it maybe because it was an easy way for them to survive, and they, and they didn't mind having the sex they were having with these people be, or being paid because of what happened to them in an early age, so they kind of fell into it. But to say that just because every sex worker is consensually agreeing to sex, that it's a joyful, happy experience for them, or that everyone who's been sexually abused, who chooses to have sex with 100 people a year, is happy with their sex life, I think misses what happens when our early child attachments and development are profoundly compromised. And when that happens, some of us make adult choices even around sex or eating, which are naturally occurring functions that are not healthy for us. That even though we say, yes, I want, the, I mean, what do you say to the person who's 350 pounds or 400 pounds? And they say, I want a gallon of haagen a night. Okay go ahead, but don't come to me with your diabetes problems and your, you know, so I would say it's the same person as, you know, if you want to see prostitutes three times a week and, you know, have affairs when you're in relationships and um, look at porn, you know, every other hour or whatever it is, and your spouse goes along with that and that works into your lifestyle, I don't care, none of my business. 
But if your sexual behavior is not leading you toward your larger goals of family, community, career, um, you know, education, um, children, then, then we have to take a look at it because you have bigger goals than just getting laid, but you're getting laid seems to be getting in the way. So, you know, the bottom line is when any pleasurable behavior, first of all, everything is not an addiction. Some people say, oh, well, can't anything be an addiction? Now everything's an addiction. No, there's only to be an addiction. It has to be highly pleasurable or produce profound emotional shift because of the consumption of it, you know? So people, for example, who are compulsive, who, who, who check the stove every hour to make sure they turn it off or wash their hands four times a day to, uh, with, because they have anxiety or fear and if they keep washing their hands, they're less afraid that they're gonna back, back you know, people have OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders. Those people are also alleviating anxiety through their behavior and they're also, um, making themselves feel better and distracting themselves. But no one could say they're washing your hands 12 times a day is a fun thing. No one can say that checking the stove 15 times brings pleasure, but drinking, using, eating, sex, those are highly pleasurable activities that can become addictive because the person gets addicted to the pleasure piece. But the consequences of all the rest of it are much greater. And so, you know, I disagree with the concept that everyone who has a sexual experience with another consensual person over with themselves is necessarily doing something sexually that is good for them or that they will feel good about later or that they really feel good about in the long run, even though it is consensual. Um, in particular, those people who have trauma and abuse in their history who make decisions that ultimately aren't good for them, but it's what they do because it's what they learned and what they know from a very dysfunctional environment growing up. And they don't, literally, they don't know any better. Um, so. In that way, they're kind of like emotional kids. You know, I, I don't wouldn't say to a 14 year old, sure, go see as many prostitutes as you want and, you know, look as much porn as you want because I would be concerned about their life. And I know that someone may be a president of the United States or a highly functioning professional or a doctor or, you know, a fireman and they may be able to carry out their life, but their life is deeply diminished in, because of their emotional challenges. They may be intellectually intact, but emotionally vulnerable. And that emotional vulnerability will bring down their intellectual ability. In other words, intellect is great until you get emotionally empty and then it goes out the window and you're going to drink and you're going to use because even though you know better, you're going to do your behavior because you're trying to fix something emotionally that can't be fixed by thinking. Um, yeah. I hope that was helpful, Kay. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. So Lynn, any roundup questions? You guys have any final yeah, so the question that we're interested in for people who are watching or listening in particular is if you've got someone who's getting in touch with the fact that they have a problem, they have an addiction with around sex or porn, or maybe they know somebody who does, uh, but in particular for the person with the addiction, what would you suggest would be some really key elements in moving towards recovery? Well, um to be a little self-serving, but nonetheless accurate, I would direct them to my website um, or tell them to go to Amazon and find me, Robert Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, -S, on Amazon. I've written eight books on the topic. So if you want to understand the very basics of sex addiction, like what could this be and how could this be an addiction and how could my 22-year-old have this problem or how could my wife or girlfriend, read Sex Addiction 101. I wrote a very basic fifth grade level text on that, you, that any sponsor could give to someone and say, hey, you might want to look at this or any therapist who, even if they're not really familiar with sex addiction, say, here, see if you identify with this. And what's your website? What's your website address? Oh, my website is uh, Robert Weiss, my name, uh, MSW, which is my degree, uh, .com. So it's R-O-B-E-R-T-W-E-I-S-S-M-S-W.com. Um, but Sex Addiction 101 is probably, I really think at the moment, the best introduction to the topic. It does talk about porn problems. It talks about women who are sex addicts. It talks about trauma and spouses, but not in depth. Um, there is a workbook that goes with that, Sex Addiction 101, the workbook. So if you wanted to start doing the work with a sponsor or you want to look at it for yourself or bring it to a therapist, you can begin to do some writing and see what comes up. Um, for spouses, um, uh, I would read uh, Mending a Shattered Heart. Um, Stephanie Karn's book on partners. Um, I think Out of the Doghouse is a very good book for spouses to understand their role in having been um, violated by a spouse who's um, having sex that they're not telling them about or relationships they're not telling them about. So the first key is education. 
I think the, the family and the person have to read it and they kind of have to buy into it. Like, oh yeah, this might be true for me. Because if you don't think it's true or you don't believe in what your healing process is or the person who's helping you, you're not going to get better. So I think first you need to say, yeah, you know, I think based on what I'm reading and I'm learning, whether it's my books or Pat Carnes or other things online, this looks like what the issue is. And then you need to go to see, you know, and then uh, once you've done your reading or as you're doing your reading, I would absolutely suggest some 12 step meetings, um, whether it's Sex Acts Anonymous or Sexual Repulsus Anonymous or Sex, uh, Sexaholics Anonymous, there are a bunch of them. And if you don't feel like you want to go into some church basement in your neighborhood at midnight to go to a 12 step meeting or nine in the evening, um, almost all of them have meetings online now. So, and I love that because when I do treatment in Tennessee at the ranch, which is where our treatment center is, I have my clients going to a Wednesday night meeting online every week because number one, I don't want to drag them in the van an hour into town, an hour back. They got to go to the meeting. That's a drag. You can't do that too many days a week. But also because I know that if they go to that online meeting while they're in treatment, they can go home to Chicago or New York or, or Namibia and they will, or, 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 you know, wherever, Ethiopia. And they can still go to that meeting and see those people. And that's one of the follow through things that gets missed in residential treatment is you recover with all these people that you love and you appreciate and you feel close to and you're going to these meetings you're getting used to and you know those people. And then you go home a thousand miles away and you don't know anybody and you're supposed to recreate this environment. So I think the idea of seeking out and finding online support, um, I, every Friday night, California time at six o'clock, I'm on a site called intherooms.com and I can't recommend it highly enough in the rooms, literally in the rooms.com. They have 160 12 step meetings a week online. So A-A-N-A-C-A-M-A, 12 step sexual recovery, gambling, it's all there. And you can sit there and not even show your face. You can be a black screen and have a fake name, but you can listen to what people are saying. And you can hear how they're talking about it. And you can hear how that process goes. And you know, one of the things I've noticed, uh, I do a show about sex, love, and addiction every Friday night at six o'clock on In The Rooms. And anyone can, in the world can go online and go to In The Rooms and sign in and find me there talking and answering questions. And like this, there instead of the three of us, there are often 60 to 100 people there. And they're from Dubai and they're from Japan and they're from India and they're from New York. And they're saying to me, I have these sexual issues and I don't know what to do about them. And we're all talking about it. And an hour before at five o'clock, California time on in the rooms, there's an SAA meeting. So you can find information, you can find support groups, you can find therapists. I think, you know, when Pat Carnes was leading this field in the way he did, you know, who wanted to go into a bookstore and buy out of the shadows, you know, for a book about sex addiction, you know, who wanted to read that book on an airplane, who wanted to, you know, go into church when the only meeting that night was the sex meeting, you know, but now you know, and these are the advantages of our tech world. And there are many, many, I don't devalue the tech world at all. Um, new problems, new solutions. Um, you know, there, is, there are so many places you can go to get help. So many places you can get, go to get information. Virtual reality, for example, is being used now for porn and soon for sex. Um, already a little bit for sex, meaning live sex partners through virtual reality glasses. But guess what? Uh, at the University of Houston, they've been working on virtual reality relapse prevention for eight years. So you put on a headset, a goggle like Oculus, and that person feels like they're in a bar. They smell the alcohol. They hear the people talking. So what virtual reality can do, yes, it can put you virtually in a sex situation. It can also put you in a virtual situation where you're, you're in a therapist's office and you feel like you're walking to the adult bookstore or you feel like you're into the, in the drug dealer's house and you smell the cigarettes and all that, but you're really in your therapist's office. And so when your heart starts to beat faster and you get all excited about what you're going to do, they can help you, as we say in the field, downregulate. They can help you um, shift your mood state, help you breathe, help you come up with alternatives in real time with a situation you're being presented with that seems real, but it's really virtual. So um, there are many tech and online and internet related ways that people can find help even before they might be ready to go see a therapist. And then when they are, um, I do recommend trying to find a CSAT or someone who is trained in sex addiction treatment. Um, Dr. Carnes has a certification. It takes, took me over a year to get certified and I now supervise people. We have about 2,500 CSATs around the United States and um, that's someone who's trained to treat sex addiction. So they're not gonna say to you, oh, just have a little more sex and, or just don't feel so ashamed and it'll all be fine. They're not gonna say to a spouse, oh, well, you know, you're just too conservative. Your husband can look all porny once. 
they're going to take the problem seriously and they're going to address it um, and evaluate for it in a way that is focused on the problem. And I think it's important to have a specialist for when you have a special issue. Um, you know, if someone is found to have cancer, I don't expect them to go to their GP. They need to go to a cancer specialist. And if they're found to have a problem with sex and addiction, they probably should go see a specialist in sex and addiction. And that's what CSATs are. Um, so education, involvement in communities and, and places where you can hear other people talking, you realize you're not the only one. And you also hear people whose behavior is changing and you hear how they've done that. Uh, meeting with therapists who are experts, being in group therapy where you're with other addicts and other people who have this problem. Faith-based groups where you can go to church and be around other men or women and be less ashamed because you shouldn't have this problem if you believe in God. Well, guess what? People who believe in God have problems too. And um, they can even go to their church and have a men's support group or a women's support group around sex and relationships where they can talk about this. The most important thing is, to, is that I think people in recovery have to find a way to be unafraid to tell their story and get help. Um, you may have ruined this marriage. You may have ruined this job. You may have destroyed getting through college in this particular place. But if you don't get help, you're going to ruin the next marriage, the next relationship. You're going to get through school. You know, you're just going to end up deeper and deeper and deeper. So, you know, having the motivation and the willingness to step up and, and dip your toe in the water with books and then online and then in real time with people, I think, is the progression. That's, that's wonderful. It sounds like there's actually a lot of people who are in recovery from sex addiction. It's oh, not yeah. a hopeless kind of a situation. It feels hopeless because it's so shameful. You know, I mean, our culture's kind of reached the point where someone, I think a woman can say to her neighbor, you know, who she's friends with, and maybe they have kids of the same age. She can say, you know, my husband just went into treatment for drinking. And you kind of know you've seen him at some parties. And, and that's, that neighbor is going to say, oh, I'm so glad for you. And how can I help you? And if you need to go to the treatment center, can I watch your kids? But I don't know that we're at a place where that woman is going to say to her neighbor, no matter how much she respects her, you know, my husband has had three affairs and looked at about, you know, 20 hours of webcam porn in the last two weeks. And I don't, I, I think he needs some, I mean, I just don't think that people are as likely to talk about this or get help for it because it feels so shameful. And if you're not out there looking for help or seeing who, it, who else is looking for help, then how would you know how many people really do have this problem? And it's funny, you know, as a sex addict, I have to say, I remember going into environments where, you know, whether it was a bathhouse or some anonymous sex place or a bookstore, whatever it was back in my day, and thinking, oh, I, I'm the only one with this problem. Now, there were people all around me who were having sex with strangers or doing whatever. I didn't think of them as having a problem. I felt like I was the only one, even though every time I went to these places, there were 50 people or 100 people or whatever it was, all doing this crazy sexual stuff. It takes me walking to a room with other dads, other gay guys, other lesbians, other people who are like you, who are ashamed and feel like they don't know what to do and talking in a very clear way about sex and about what you want to change, knowing you're not going to be judged and you're going to be supported and you're going to get help, it takes that motivation and willingness for change to occur. Um, and when you do that, you will find out that, yes, um, one in 10, something like that, uh, addicts certainly is struggling with sex addiction and, you know, a good percentage of the population. Um, let me just say this to you. Um, you may ask me, well, how many people are sex addicts? You know, how many sex addicts do we have? And I'm going to say to you, well, how many alcoholics do we have? Because we don't know. You know, lots of people go home and get drunk and pass out every night, but they make it to work the next day. And they get through the day and they go home and get drunk that night. And, you know, they most certainly are alcoholics, but they're functional alcoholics. So they don't come to us for help because they're somehow getting by. They don't believe or want to believe they have a problem and they want to keep drinking. And so those people will never get help or they won't until they get arrested and they're ordered to help or something like that. And it's not any different for sex addiction, you know, um, except that with sex addiction, it's more shameful. It's more embarrassing. It's a joke, you know. Oh, yeah, that's what I want to be, a sex addict. No, you don't. That's like saying you want to be an alcoholic and drive into trees, you know. You may like drinking. That's okay. And sex is okay, too. But sex in the way that sex addicts carry it out is like driving drunk. You know, you just don't want to be that person. So thank you so much, Rob. This has been really interesting. I've certainly learned a lot. Oh, good. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Um, I don't ever tire of talking about this because 
someone needs to be talking about it, you know, mm -hmm. and you guys know whether you choose to put this in the piece or not, that most people who are sent to an addiction center or a mental health center are never asked about masturbation. They're never asked about affairs. They're never asked about porn. And yet when we assess people, when they come into treatment, we ask them about eating, we ask them about exercise, we ask them about education, we ask them about their bodies, their family life, but we don't, it is not written into psych, into therapy assessments to ask specifically about sex, but we ask about everything else. And I have a feeling that's more of a cultural bias that needs to change because if you eat, you go to the bathroom, you know? And if you are, uh, if you have hormones and you are built like an adult, you probably have sex. And so, you know, and if you are a human being, you probably eat occasionally. So why can we ask about all the other stuff and not ask about sex? And I think that's on, on our uh, therapeutic community to have a better relationship and comfort level in talking about sex. Because my experience is even the non-sex addicts, the ones who've just had an affair or looked at a little porn, or maybe they did something in Vegas three years ago at a conference, they want to talk about it too. But if we don't ask, they'll never talk about it. They're dying for us to ask. We just don't. Um, and uh, so I would say courage to all of you people out there who want to talk about this or feel you need to talk about this. And if your therapist doesn't feel comfortable or isn't in a place, find someone who is. Talk to these ladies. I'm sure they are more than glad to comfortably and with a lot of support um, allow you to talk about things that you think you don't ever want to talk about with anyone. And so one of the things that I, I just want to close with is a statement that Pat Carnes, my mentor and friend, made and makes often, which is that sexual secrets are often the ones that cause us the most pain and the most heartache, and yet they're the ones that we are least likely to talk about. And I think it takes the right therapist and a courageous treatment environment to say, well, there's nothing we can't talk about here. You know, that we're human beings. We poop, we eat, we have sex, and all of it could be good or some of it could be problematic, and we got to talk about all of it because good therapists and good addiction people understand that it isn't just one thing in your life that's causing the problem. It's your whole life that's the problem. And we've got to look at all of it, including sex and love, in order to make sure that you stay well, no matter what the issue is. And with that, I just want to say, um, what a pleasure to have you guys let me ramble at you for all this time. Um, uh, and I would appreciate if you can make available um, maybe my website or some of the S meetings websites or in the rooms or places where people can, uh, when they re see this, they can actually go to your site or whatever and click and say, okay, I saw that here. I want to get more information or help. Go to killabycenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit, to see the full schedule of speakers and to register to watch these free online September 23rd and 24th in the Radical Recovery Summit 2017.